Um, so Daniel and I, this is a funny and delightful conversation for me since Daniel and I have known each other for more than 15 years and we've had this ongoing conversation about what is Jewish life, what is culture, what is ritual, and um, the conversation keeps continuing and now we're in a place where we're having this conversation, both of us working at Jewish museums and Dan having curated an exhibition that now is the text that we are commenting on, so that's a really nice thing to, uh, to experience. So. Um, We've been talking for two days already about these issues, and in a way, we're just going to kind of continue talking. Um, but we also want to start from the beginning, in a way. And the beginning question is, um, how did you think about this show? How did it come into your mind, and where did you start in terms yeah. of putting it together? I mean, this, the beginning of the show uh, predated my arrival at the Jewish Museum. And in fact, it does go back to our own conversations so going in, you know, starting in the 90s, there's been a major sea change in the practice of Judaism and in the way people have been responding to the main core issues in Judaism and this continual process of reinvention that, of course, has occurred throughout the centuries uh, for Judaism to reconnect to different aspects of local cultures and um, political movements and everything that has ma maintained it as a contemporary living tradition. Um, these things in the United States came to a sort of a new head and a new uh, sense of self-awareness and self-consciousness in, in the 90s when uh, things like feminism, environmentalism, which had uh, started off and sort of the margins of critique of Judaism uh, moved into the mainstream in the 90s. And there was this really interesting uh, ferment that was happening and artists picked up on it, not just visual artists, writers, filmmakers, um, you know, playwrights, uh, really everyone. There was a, you know, certainly a web component to all of this as well. And uh, the Jewish Museum in New York uh, was very much sensitive and aware of all of these changes and started tracking the progress through Judaica. And Judaica is a very specific area of, of art and design. It's an interesting hybrid between, um, between things that are um, conventionally used in ritual and are meant to somewhat disappear uh, into the ritual, but also works of art that um, respond to different craft traditions uh, and industrial design uh, moments of concept and connection of concept and practice. So that, um, that research started the Jewish Museum in 1998 when they created a contemporary Judaic uh, acquisitions committee. And uh, because the movement of contemporary had um, become so conceptually driven that and had distanced itself from what people sense were sort of traditional Judaic objects and what Judaica should look like, that they felt that it had its own set of criteria and its own set of uh, characteristics had emerged and that you needed a separate committee that could, um, could expect that something that could want to deal with ritual and Jewish ritual but doesn't necessarily have to function as a ritual object, yet could still be considered Judaica. So we call these pieces conceptual Judaica. So that was the origins of some of the ideas in the show and the museum started collecting in earnest this type of work and um, an idea for the show of the title Reinventing Ritual, um, I think or goes as early as about 2001, but it's hard to put these uh, shows together just because um, we can't do a contemporary Judaica show because no, you know, no one would really come to that if it was just you know, ritual objects. You need to find things that operate in a larger scale and um, have that performative element of ritual to them. So people want to see people doing things. And um, so it wasn't until I arrived in 2007 that we had the opportunity to find um, concept for a show that could include all of the specific ritual objects that are being made that can be used in ritual, but then also a handful of installations and videos that are not uh, functional ritual objects themselves, but give people like a broader framework for where ritual happens. So that's the, you know. The on one leg. Yeah. <laughs> story. Um, I wonder if we could go from like kind of the historical, intellectual to the specific for a moment and um, to, to look at uh, an image that I know we had talked about was something you saw early in the process. And I'm also, can everyone see or is it, should I move? Okay. 
So, Dan, do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Yeah. You know, this is sort of one of those things where, like, you know, the first thing the duck sees says, calls mama. And so it's sort of, I was just new to this topic of, uh, of contemporary Judaica. I didn't study it in graduate school. Um, it was not something that anyone really studies in graduate school because it's just uh, is more of a connected to people's lived experience. And so they kind of come to it uh, as a calling or as... Uh, a set of intellectual questions that get them there. So when I was trying to figure out like, what's going on in contemporary Judaica, where these uh, conceptual elements of feminism or environmentalism, of uh, reconstituting the relationship between the individual and the community is happening, um, I, I think I remember where I saw this. Oh, um, oh interestingly enough, it was, uh, well, I should describe this work before giving the backstory of the work. This is. Uh, called Fringe Garment is by Rachel Cantor. She's an artist who's based in uh, New York or now in New Jersey. And this to me exhibits like the qualities of hybridity that are essential in uh, defining what is contemporary Judaic. Uh, this is at once a, a talit, a prayer shawl, um, but at the same time it also has the form of a kitchen apron. And it's a complex work because it is both an homage to the way that uh, women were not allowed to, uh, or rarely were encouraged to wear the, the tzitzit, um, which rem remember the commandments, and you can see the tzitzit hanging from the bottom of the prayer shawl. Um, but at the same time, she wanted to, so it was one hand a piece where she was talking about how women were excluded from certain rituals, but then she also wanted to elevate what the rituals that women were actually doing, and so she said, was redefining the kitchen as a sacred space, and so, by choosing a pattern from the 1940s, it was uh, an homage to her grandmother and, and what her, her grandmother's participation to Jewish ritual was, but also came out of her contemporary life as a mother with uh, three small children, but who goes to a conservative synagogue and wanted to wear a, uh, a prayer shawl that wasn't exactly her father's prayer shawl, but would be functional with taking care of small children. So she realized that by having it not being this big draping thing, but being sort of cinched and closer to the body, yet still having the four corners and following all the rules and regulations that an, any other prayer shawl would have, it could satisfy this contemporary design problem. So it, it's a really layered and complex work, and that's why we came up with these uh, labels that describe the ritual and the reinvention, because uh, each of these works operate in two, at least two different languages. You know, they operate in the language of Jewish ritual, and they also operate in the language of contemporary art and design. And you can't necessarily assume that everyone is fully conversant in both of, the, uh, both of those. And it also comes out of people's personal stories and sort of impetus to, they have a, there's a problematic in their own life as a Jew, and sometimes even not Jewish, but they're interested in something that's happening in Judaism, and so they they create these objects. So a lot of the artists in the show aren't Judaic artists per se. They don't spend their whole careers thinking about Judaism. They are often people who are working in uh, different materials and then have an occasion or a reason, a motivation to create something that's reflecting um, this contemporary need to reinvent what's happening. Um, the show's been open for a couple weeks. Um, and one of the things that's so fun about a show and that I'm you know, also, it's just to um, see what people are saying and to listen to their questions and try to answer questions. And uh, there have been a couple of responses to this, mostly as I've been, you know, talking to a small group or something that I thought were really interesting. The first was that um, the idea of the, an apron, maybe it's a woman's apron, maybe it's not, that'll be the second point. Um, and the kind of the tzitzit, the fringe garment, that in this object, that they are not Seen, they're not in opposition. They're kind of connected. And there's the kind of the possibility of a synthesis. Even though the object is a little bit provocative or cheeky in some way, there's still the sense that it is a kind of an integrated garment, yeah. which is itself a kind of interesting philosophical yeah, statement. Yeah, I think, I, I, yeah, it's, that's one of the ideas behind a lot of the works of show, too, is that it is things that were seem to be in opposition to each other using craft are synthesized. You know, another uh, example I always go back to is, um, you know, gays and orthodoxy, and there was this great film that came out called Trembling Before God, probably like 10 years ago, but it still, it just captured this moment and the struggle of people who are gay and lesbian and from observant backgrounds or became observant and just a, almost a stubborn unwillingness to be forced to choose one identity or the other, but it, 
like standing their ground and saying, like, no, I can actually bring these two things together. And so um, I think Rachel also brings together you know, the male and the female in a lot of different uh, dimensions. And a lot of these artists are using craftsmanship to bring things together. It's sort of a, a you know, post-postmodern utopian moment. You know, I think of postmodernism as deconstruction and challenging all of the, uh, you know, all the standard narratives and texts that uh, often divided people and created hierarchies. And these artists are looking across the landscape where that has been deconstructed and there are all these pieces lying around and they say, okay, how do we go forward from now here? Let's bring these pieces back together again. Did, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it was a spontaneous artwork. She's someone, she had designed a number of uh, talitot that were more traditional women's talitot, meaning they were still shawls, but they had pictures of her, um, you know, female relatives, or they used patterns or colors that were more associated with, uh, with women. Um, so she'd already been working with a talit, and then this became a more radical reinvention of the form. But she was also was thinking about the, uh, the Kohanim in the temple and the, um, blanking on the word, but sort of the, uh, the types of garments that they are thought to have worn. And so, so she's... Yeah, yeah. There's like a real desire to go back to the origins in a lot of artists too. They want to just, you know, so like what, you know, what is sort of the primal experience of all of these rituals and where do they really come from and what's sort of the essence of them and that's another level. And this also, the, you know, the uh, red dots represent pomegranate seeds and the blue waves represent water, which are uh, commonly associated with uh, women but also with Torah. You know, uh, the pomegranate is thought to have 613 seeds, the same number of mitzvot. And there have been interesting metaphors about water and the, comparing water and Torah. So it does, there's a lot going on there. That's why it's nice to have the curator here. I'm like, oh, <laughs> hadn't thought about that. Go that's actually wanted. I mean, She never wore it, uh, but she has these workshops that she'll do. Because she's made a whole bunch of others in this series that are different, type, different types of aprons. So this happens to be a kitchen apron from 1940s. She found the pattern on eBay. But she also is interested in 70s aprons and cobbler's aprons. And so she has conducted several workshops with women in either in synagogues or outside of synagogues, encouraging them to, to simply wear the, uh, wear the talit if they've never worn one before. Um, so it has this uh, interactive quality to it. And you know, it also, her own story is very interesting too, because she was trained in ceramics. She has an MFA from Rochester, which is like a great uh, program. And then part of having her own uh, children was she had to close down her studio, her ceramic studio, and find a new source of her creativity. And so she turned to fiber arts and embroidery and um, sewing and as uh, something that she could do in her house uh, and has you know lower cost uh, to it. So. So that opened up all these other possibilities. So that interaction between the personal and the professional. These are all these are all trained artists. I mean, with maybe one, you know, one or two exceptions. And so it's interesting how they redeploy their their own skills to what's what's going on. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, all of those uh, categories sort of have been blurring. This is something that probably, you know, forced to give an answer. This is something that exists more in the, the craft world, but because the art uh, has this often a conceptual co uh, component to it, that um, perhaps changes its nature from being purely a crafted work to something that um, can offer the same level of commentary and engagement with the history of its own origins and other types of works that it's responding to that you know, comfortably could exist in, in art. But a lot of these artists also, some of them were, are industrial designers, some of them are craftspeople, some of them are traditional artists. So 
it's a bit of a blurring of all of these boundaries for the show, especially bringing in a lot of different media. So there's metals, there's fiber and textiles, there's video installation, you know, concrete, sculpture, drawing. Uh, the only thing I didn't have is photography, because I thought photography was like too documentary and too uh, static. And so with all the videos, they were actually capturing the artists performing their own reinventing rituals. So we couldn't, uh, in the way the show was conceived, we didn't have people actually performing rituals in the gallery. And it's sort of interesting question that we could get to about, you know, that kind of division between um, the difference between a ritual perf as performance or an object, which is either a token of the performance or participates in the performance or has a process-oriented nature to it that it has an aura of action and performance, but of course is, is ultimately static. I want to maybe probe that a little further. The question of um, whether it's art or it's craft is suggestive of a number of kind of dichotomies or hybrid relationships in the show. And another one is, as you're suggesting, you know, what is art and what is ritual? Um, and I know that you, can, in your essay, you talked a little bit about the definition, the idea of relational aesthetics and so forth. Would you be willing to unpack that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, it, I mean, it's in the title of the talk, which is like, you know, I thought, yep. it, I thought a good one. And um, which is uh, <laughs> art is art, art is ritual, ritual, ritual is, is art, or maybe it's the other way around. Yeah. So it just it did come out of this, um, you know, before even getting to like relational aesthetics. You know, it's good to talk about uh, another way to look at the difference between art and ritual, if there is a difference, um, is this notion of creativity. And, uh, and we were, I've been in dialogue with you know, Arnie Eisen, who's now the chancellor of JTS, about um, this type of work. And he contributed a really beautiful uh, preface for the catalog. And he talked about how ritual almost has like a negative you know, association to it. People often think of it as being something static or rote or handed down. Um, sort of an non-thinking type of behavior or an unchanging type of behavior. And uh, what, you know, in addition to sort of disagreeing with that conventional understanding, I think a lot of artists are also seeing that there is a high degree of uh, creativity that can be affected in ritual and also that each time the same thing is performed, there's always these subtle differences. And so this is also, you know, a work of this is a time of subtle differences. Artists aren't making huge statements. They're making small distinctions between, between types of practices. And um, so they're very excited by that possibility that there can be, there is a lot of creativity that goes into ritual. Um, but then there's also this question, Hadassah Goldvik, who I don't think, I don't know if her slide is immediately queued up after this one. Maybe, I don't know if we should. Um, Skip to it. We'll we'll see. Might get some previews of everything. Um, she's uh, she's an artist who grew up ultra ultra orthodox in Israel, and um, boys when they turn three in uh, in her community and a lot of other uh, very orthodox communities when they start school they lick honey off of the letters to know that learning is sweet. So as a girl she didn't participate in this ritual. So here as a, and this is a, a still of a video, by the way. So here is a, um, a young woman. She uh, created her own version of this ritual where she wrote the Hebrew alphabet in honey on the scrim. And the aleph is on the upper right, and it goes across. And it's a looped video. It's less than two minutes long. And you simply watch her licking the honey off of, of the scrim. And so she is reenacting this, a version of this ritual, and has a lot of really interesting metaphorical possibilities about the relationship between the body and language and as a connection to, to God or to the community. Um, and then the gender politics are also embedded in that. But you know, when, when she's asked to talk about the work, she often talks about it in terms of failure and that she sees this as a, a failed ritual. It was, fa it was failed because she didn't participate in as that is in the age appropriate time. And she, um, as an adult, she re did this ritual, but it couldn't repair that kind of that loss. And so I've adapted her definition of this video as, sort of, as a failure to think about all art in a way as sort of a failed ritual. And that a ritual object um, is successful because it participates in 
the ritual, it somewhat disappears um, because it's the performance of the ritual. It's a vehicle more, for the ritual. It's a vehicle for the ritual, or it's not the point necessarily. And um, works that almost halt the ritual or create some moment of reflection upon the ritual cause this moment of failure. It doesn't have to be permanent failure, but it's like that moment of failure of questioning and reconsideration. And that's part of the, the art part. Go ahead. Right. Uh, and ritual for me denotes powerful feelings and emotions. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about, uh, you know, when I see some of the work that I've seen here, maybe from my point of view, mm -hmm. maybe too, too conceptual, too in the head. And I'm wondering about art that really evokes those powerful feelings and emotions that ritual did for me when I was a Jewish child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, it, it depends on what emotionally engages people. Um, but I think um, this, is, this is a conceptually oriented show, and I've thought a lot about um, other types of art shows that deal with art and religion. And often spirituality is the more um, common framework that people use. And it tends to have more emotionally driven works that often are more abstract. Um, color and light are usually deployed in more dynamic ways. And, but something about ritual, at least my read of ritual, was the, how the artists were really thinking about ritual. These artists were, these artists have done their research. I mean, they've actually, they do a lot of reading. They're, um, they look at a lot of images. They do a lot of thinking about these rituals. So, so I think that is a good observation on your part that this might be a contemporary approach to ritual is, is largely conceptual in that uh, for, for the parts of artists. And I think the emotional hinge is is maybe a jumping off point for the artists, for their own personal stories. Um, but is, the videos, I think, convey, and the performances convey more of an emotion um, where music and is, is included as well. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Now she knows it and she's leery about it because she's still very observant and she's not fully in her community, but she's very much connected to it. So this, this work has been shown a number of times even before you know, I showed it. And so there's a bit of, for her and some of the art, other artists who are very observant, there's some trepidation in showing these works because they still f are sensitive to uh, what people in that larger community might say to it. I do think of this uh, screen as a bit of a mechitza that separates her from us. So, so maybe assuming the us is maybe a, a, you know, a male gaze, but just sort of at least separating her as a woman from everyone else. So I think that might be a way that she helped uh, mitigate some of the sensuality. But it's, 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 very, uh, it's a really powerful work. And so it's, you know, I think that's, she allows that sensuality to be promoted and so I think you know we realize that there are a lot of rituals that are highly sensual and do engage all of the the senses um, in Judaism and, and act and because of the connections between 
Judaism and the everyday are so strong, and the everyday does include, you know, things like eating and drinking and sex and everything else that inevitably there are rituals that are connected to that. And, you know, things like mik I don't, there's no piece that relates to the mikveh in this uh, show, but there has been a lot of other interesting works about mikveh. So, another thing that really, you know, show, you know, deals with the body. Um, can I just follow up? If I, and then um, your question about um, kind of the power of the ritual and so forth, I think that opens up another dimension of the exhibition and the discussion, which has to do with the fact that in the last generation, um, there's been um, kind of a dem democratization of Jewish life and Jewish ritual, whether it's the Chapura movement or something like the Jewish catalog from the early 70s. Um, and so there, I think there's a sense of these artists showing the possibility of creating one's own ritual that's powerful for them individually. And so I think that for a lot of these artists, and I think at least some people who come to the exhibition see a sense of um, real emotional power, if not in connecting to a specific ritual, but in the idea that, oh, I can create a ritual that is relevant for me that draws upon traditional ideas and motifs and so forth. So I guess I'm, maybe I'm wondering how that may have played into some of your thinking yeah, I mean, the categories that while these works are grouped in in the show, we're trying to bridge that gap between these highly particular rituals within Judaism to the possibility that anyone might have an awareness of their own, their own rituals or how, uh, or at least their relationship to rituals and how rituals structure some aspects of their life. They don't have to be religious rituals, you know, high school graduations or anything like that are highly ritualized. So uh, these four categories of thinking and covering, absorbing and building uh, that collect these different works. And some of the works can easily go into m multiple categories, but just for the sake of the exhibition space that was available, they were grouped in these ways. And um, they tried to be broad and active. And uh, they take the normal locuses uh, that we think of for ritual, like the body and space and the text, but put them into motion and give us a sense that identity as a verb and that the idea of uh, one's identity as a Jew or in any way is in constant state of construction and construction entails actions and performances that are then connected to rituals. And so uh, something like, uh, let's say, absorbing, to go back to the earlier example with Hadassah is, uh, you know, uh, other way things are taken into the body and how rituals regulate um, things that are taken into the body and covering um, deals with uh, the external side of the body and how the body is experienced or encountered by, by other people. So I try to make it a little more, um, I didn't spell it out necessarily, but I think that was totally driving the, uh, the, way, it was, the way it was structured. Yeah, um, one was made, a few were made specifically for the show. One was uh, a Marian Cup by Michelle Okadoner. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't have a slide for it, but it's, um, the Miriam Cup is a sort of like the exemplar of a feminist ritual object. It's uh, designed to hold water and it brings Miriam to the, the Passover story and in the way that um, Elijah has his cup on the, the Seder table, and Miriam, the major, major player in the Passover story, isn't mentioned in the Haggadah, and so this is a way, you know, having a Miriam cup on the table is a way to bring her into, and women's uh, lives in general, into the story. And so it's something that had been invented, I think, in the 80s, had multiple uses that hadn't been, slowly been formalized, and we felt it was almost this invented ritual was ripe for reinvention, so we asked an artist to come up with a more sculptural take on it instead of just looking like a normal wine goblet that had some uh, different types of imagery on it. She thought of it, again, thing at origin, she imagined what Miriam might have been doing at the well and how she would have potentially used a palm frond to have, uh, to have uh, retrieved water from the well, and so she, through her own process of direct casting and manipulating an actual piece of a palm frond was able to produce a very new and interesting Miriam cup. Um, and there are a couple of other things that are recreations. Um, 
go to Tobarn's work. So this is um, this is the how it's, uh, this piece was seen in the Jewish Museum in, in New York, but it's all, you know it has a very different look here when it's on the white walls. Um, so Tobarn Waxman uh, is an artist who had a ritual performance or uh, a performance that was connected to ritual uh, in 2000, where he had a hair cutting ceremony, for lack of a better word for it, and um, where he appropriated another Hasidic ritual of where boys turn three and they get, they get their first haircut. So they go from sort of a female identity to a male identity. And so the artist himself uh, was becoming transgendered, was born female, and was uh, becoming a male. And so he, while in art school, he did appropriate this ritual and did his own version of it um, where and there's a video up here where you can, you can see it, where he sat on the stool and the hair was still attached to his head and was uh, connected with these brackets and sus uh, suspended from the, uh, the ceiling. So it would just look like all over the place and people would one by one come and cut off these locks of hair. And so he very powerfully became implicated in his own process of transformation. And, um, so this happened in 2000, and then since that time, he carefully saved all of the hair, and these are all the original wires and brackets and everything from 2000, but it had just been in a, uh, you know, a crate in his mother's house in Toronto. And so um, after having selected this work to be uh, included in the show, we had to reinvent it as a installation and trying to evoke the sense that the performance had just occurred, but this was nine years ago. Uh, and he did re-edit. He had took a lot of video footage of it, and um, had never had the opportunity to uh, to edit it. And so, we had a long conversation about what to do. And we took the sort of the Warholian tactic of doing very little editing. In fact, the video is seven or eight hours long. And so, hopefully, one day he'll have the chance to show it in a setting where people could really sit and watch it if they wanted to. So I think that's more, those are some of the specific things. But the works are, have been produced in the last 10 years. And uh, about a third are from the museum's own collection. And a third were, were things that I hunted and gathered. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, the work itself is contemporary, but the artists are, it's a multi-generational group of artists. And, you know, Helene Ailan, uh, who has a major uh, installation, has been also reinventing ritual, Jewish rituals and ritual objects since the 70s. Um, so I felt it was important to, to not just say that this is something that was happening only since the 90s, but talk about uh, the pioneer, you know, to include some of the pioneers in this movement and Mira Leda Manukalis also was doing important mikvah pieces in the 80s. And I think who else? Um, Alan Wexler and Toby Kahn uh, have been thinking about these issues uh, also from that standpoint. Well, I certainly have a couple more questions. Um, one, um, I don't know if this is a question or a statement. I'll decide midway through. Um, but uh, this museum has. Um, initiated something called an invitational work for the past 20 years. They've been inviting artists to um, submit works which are basically, um, you know, reinventing a menorah or a spice box or something like that. Um, so I certainly heard about that before I heard about the show. And I, in my mind, I had seen this as kind of like a West Coast phenomenon, this idea of like reinvention and kind of the democratic nature of it and so forth. Um, so I'm, I'm Clearly, this is just a statement, but um, it's it's interesting how um, uh, that there's been already 20 years of that happening. Um, I guess my question maybe has to do with uh, now I know the question. 
finally. Um, I was thinking about the kind of, it was when you were talking about starting this in the 60s and what I think of as kind of the, the, um, the do-it-yourself ethos of that time, um, including like the Jewish catalog with Richard Siegel, whom Daniel and I both worked for in the 90s, um, and then kind of halfway between now and then, the series of Invitational started, and then in the 90s, it seems like a lot of this work, late 90s, 2000, was created. So I guess I was just thinking about is this, how much of this is a, a generational? Is it two generational? Are there, would, could you divide the last 45 years up into any kind of periods, or how, how do things shake out in terms of chronology? Yeah, and no, I think you've definitely put your finger upon, there's like the Jewish catalog and the Havara movement that came out in the, you know, the late 60s and, and the 70s are the essential precursors to a lot of this work. And a lot of the DIY culture has returned and the idea of the post-denominational Judaism has also returned in the last 10 years or so. And um, there have been a lot of interesting conversations about what's the difference between the, the Havara movement of the 60s and the, you know, the Minyan movement of, of now. And um, you know, I don't know if there's been definitive answers, but I think there's, there's actually a little more of a, what's happening now is both more radical and more conservative in a way because the, it's, I think it's more radical because you have these moments where people are uh, more and more bringing the, that margins of feminism and uh, you know, gay politics or environmentalism have been embraced by the mainstream. And so you have these more radical juxtapositions being harmonized, but in that process, they become maybe more of, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, conservative is not maybe the best word, but there's a traditionalist strain too. There's a, a bit of a hunger among younger people for the tradition and for the essence of tradition, but they want to do it in their own way, and they want to find their own way in. And there's almost a bit of a, a willful ignorance on their part, the need to wipe the slate clean and to um, find their own ways into the tradition. And often they seize upon things that are not as well known because there's a freshness to it. Um, so it's interesting which, which rituals also seem to where creativity seems to cluster. So like life cycle events, there's a lot of wedding related uh, objects in the show. And there's not a lot dealing with birth and death, you know, equally uh, powerful, you know, uh, rituals or even, you know, moments in, in life, but creativity hasn't been um, brought to bear to the same extent as weddings or bar mitzvah also hasn't, bar mitzvah hasn't received the same level. So there's a bit of a, a social, uh, cultural gravitation towards different things. It's not um, purely within the chronological, too. But you mentioned, you know, relational aesthetics before, and it's just sort of also just the notion that contemporary art in general and contemporary design is really interested now in relationships as being aestheticized and as being art in itself, uh, and performance art being brought into the you know, into the museum space, not just a one-off, but as being preserved and presented. So I think it's interesting that, you know, like the, 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 um, the Julie Seltzer writing the, the Torah project, I mean, that's, to me, it's, that also is like um, a great example of what's happening now in reinventing ritual. It's like very radical to have someone writing a Torah in a museum, especially a young woman, but at the same time, it's like what's more conventional and conservative than writing a Torah, you know? She's not, She's completely, uh, you know, um, respectful of the tradition. She's following everything, but it's someone who's completely different and mm -hmm. unexpected. And she herself is traditionally she's observant. And, and she's traditionally observant. So it's, that, that piece is, you know, I think it's a really great piece and a lot of, it has a lot of the essences of what's going on right now. Yeah. No, no, you're. Yeah, no, your question answers itself. Yeah. So, there was that mezuzah in 1264. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that begs the question too that um, there's we had a big debates within the museum about whether we should 
include what we call traditional Judaic uh, objects that are older, you know, pre-20th century, let's say, to help people understand some of the more contem contemporary or radical pieces. And then we realize, in fact, there is no normative Judaica because everything is its own reinvention or its own um, contemporary take on what was happening at the time. And so there are certain standardized things that we can point to, and, but, uh, but overall, they have to be really unpacked and, and discussed from the same frameworks that, that we have. So it's always a contemporary art show is running the risk of uh, trying to proclaim, proclaim something as being new when in fact there's always precursors to, to what's happening or it's just the latest iteration of a process that's been happening for several thousand years. But um, the choice of materials that people are using, the references, uh, and the issues that are brought to bear are inherently contemporary. Um, I don't have a watch on. Can someone tell me what time it is? 10 to 3. 10, 10 to three. Um, maybe we'll, we'll see if there's maybe one more question. Um, Tell me your name. <laughs> Susan Felix. Susan Felix. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Before, yeah. And with the, I'll just say one more thing. I have been doing this for a while, you know, since the 60s, really. So when they had the invitation, I'll show people that we're not going to invite you to create your day because we're already creating it together, you know. And that, that's a kind of a little bit of a nice thing. Because, I'm, I mean, I'm still doing the event you do things. Yeah, you know, issues of style and taste also play, you know, play into a lot of these uh, decisions. But it's interesting about the notion of the invitational too, because a lot of works are, um, you know, in that in this show were inspired to be created by other people, by institutions, by the Jewish Museum here. There's a Jewish Museum in Philadelphia. Um, other you know, projects that are happening in Israel inspired the creation of new work. So there's that engagement or dialogue between the individual and the community. And you know, ritual objects don't happen in a vacuum. And so they're always connected to, to something that's happening in, in the artist's life or in, in the community that then is pointing to an artist and bringing the artist into uh, a ritual framework, which sometimes they're initially even resistant to. And, you get a lot of interesting tensions that, hopefully, if they're resolved, can often result in the best. The commercial outside the commercial element too. I mean, some of these uh, all these works are multiples. They're products. They're for sale, you know, in the shop here, and uh, and were produced as products. And so I wanted the the show to be open to that as well because um, they can't just be these one-off uh, precious works that are museum pieces, but also things that are maybe not the most common styles and materials, but certainly are just are available for anyone to, to use and bring home. One, one final question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, changes which normally don't happen. Right. Uh, and I, I haven't seen the exhibition yet here, but I'm curious if there is a benefit if the show combines the older, mm -hmm. the older progressive stuff and the very modern mm -hmm. intermix. And benefit if you do it in that fashion. 
Yeah, I think you could, you know, track stylistic evolution of specific things and also origins. You know, not, it's not like all every type of Judaica was started at the same time. I mean, things were invented by different communities at different points in time, and then they they stuck, and so uh, it becomes a historical show too uh, when you can begin to trace, you know, when things uh, became formalized and their, in, the, in their styles and their forms and even their, their shapes. And so it's, uh, it's very, very telling. I had maybe two brief answers and then we'll maybe make a couple of housekeeping announcements. So the one is that um, in the show, as, as you'll see, that a lot, there are a lot of ritual objects that seem traditional, that are beautifully crafted, but that if you wanted to see like what a, a menorah or a, um, a mezuzah or something, um, there are some that look very traditional, and there, there is so there is internal to that. There is a kind of historical reference, but also the as it is the uh, uh, reinventing ritual show is paired with the show about uh, the, our, our scribe as it is written, which is about writing the Torah and all the accoutrement to the Torah, and uh, and a lot of ritual traditional ritual objects are there. So in the gallery upstairs in Kashmir Gallery, you have these two exhibitions, and in a way they're they're in dialogue, and I think that if you see both of them together, and they're designed as kind of this circle that you can do each one in like kind of this crescent or you can kind of go in and out and so um, for, for, for just a reason yeah um, so uh, I um, thank you Daniel Velasco for